working. Well, first of all, many thanks to Stephen for inviting me here. I have learned a lot and have been astonished, furious, delighted, amused, entertained, outraged, confused, among many other emotions and feelings. I'm not going to solve the hard or even the soft problem of consciousness, but I am going to take a couple of large herbivorous mammals and describe a way to try and find out more about their subjectivity and consciousness. Think of it as a thought experiment, if you like. Here and there, I've tried to include the relevance of various other papers that I've heard during the conference, but I'm not going to be quoting names and references, I'm afraid, because there isn't time, apart from anything else. But it'll all be in the printed paper. We've heard a lot about squirrels. A squirrel in the head, like fairies, are real to the individual experiencing them. Even if you don't believe it, they do. Another squirrel sees a cat approaching a tree and runs up the tree. This is an old squirrel. You've probably heard this one before. This, it is maintained, is just an automatic instinctive response with no awareness. Any old or even young lady who sits in her sitting room watching squirrels through the window knows that often the squirrel is making decisions and choices. He doesn't always run up the tree. He may run, run around the tree. He may jump across to another tree from the ground. He is aware of what he's doing, at least in some sense. He may jump across to, oh, sorry. He may not be frightened. He may be furious or frustrated when he's up the tree. The reason why I'm taking time to point out that ignorant this is because ignorance of another species or beliefs founded on preconceptions and current dogma is just not good enough if we really want to find out more about another's consciousness. But luckily, there is quite a lot of information out there which we should not ignore. An important and often neglected source of information concerning other mammals' behavior and mental attributes, in, the case, in this case, it's equines and elephants, comes from the 7,000 years of domestication, during which people have been keeping, teaching, living, and working with these animals. The good teacher knows that some understanding of the feelings of another is essential when teaching or dealing with mammals. Since these animals are large and strong, if their feelings are not understood and taken into account, i.e. some sort of empathetic arrangement, injury or death of the teacher is not at all uncommon. For example, Mahouts in India who teach elephants and they are taught that elephants are dangerous. They must ensure, ensure obedience by carrying an ankus to hurt and frighten them into submission. But 200 Mahouts were killed in 10 years by 3,000 elephants in Kerala. Does this illustrate that these animals are inevitably dangerous automatic robots or that the way they are thought about and treated causes this? To date, science has contributed very little to a better understanding of the emotions or the teaching of other mammals. We have now a considerable amount of knowledge concerning the bodies and behavior of equines and elephants. To assess their mental attributes, we must extend the research and gather information from all relevant disciplines. This includes anatomy, morphology, physiology, ecology, experimental psychology, neuroscience, philosophy of mind, cognitive science, you name it. Although such three third-person information is helpful, it is the first-person experiences of the world, the hard problem, which still remains. How does that individual feel to that individual? <coughs> Only if we begin to ask this question will we approach an understanding. Ignorance of that species and an effort to remain objective will not get us far. Actions and practical results may get us just a little nearer. This praise presents the conclusions of critically assessed knowledge concerning the subjectivity or epistemology or consciousness of equines, elephants, and compares this to humans. The first step is to understand the mammalian body and mind similarities. 
Superimposed on these are the species differences and finally the differences between individuals. This three-pronged approach is called conditional anthropomorphism. It has previously been suggested by Fitcher and Burkhardt in the early 1990s, but generally dismissed and ignored by the scientific establishment. Now, most of us realize that feelings and emotions are important when considering mental attributes of others, is the time to reinstate and develop it if we really want to learn more about these species, which I do. You may not, but I do. That other mammals have feelings and a point of view has to be proved by experiment. Is surely just Mark Blind Mary's belief, with no experience of colours, that the only way to know that colour exists is by neuroanatomical and physiological measures. As Popper suggested, we need to set up a hypothesis about the different animals' experiences, feelings and subjectivity and test it. Let me, point out to those who, let me point out that those who teach animals are often doing just that. Perhaps we should profit from this information. Throughout this talk, when I have time, I'll give examples to illustrate various points, but I do have plenty of examples uh, which I won't be including. But if it, nothing else, these examples will bring to life various facets of others' mentality that need to be debated rather than ignored. But first we need to point out some misconceptions that have been sometimes a little bit evident during this conference, in my view. <laughs> An irrational stance and the need for the shifting of the burden of proof. Some things are self-evident because of the character of that species. Thus, it is irrational, if one believes in evolution, to assume it must be tested. This has been much, there has been much time and public money spent on proving such things, particularly when arguing about animal welfare. For example, in a multidisciplinary discussion on animal ethics organized by the Society of Applied Philosophy in Glasgow some years ago, one distinguished scientist argued that we had to prove whether or not ducks needed water other than to drink before we gave it to them in their pens. This is despite the knowledge that ducks are water birds. They live, swim, copulate, raise their young on water. The scientist was not prepared to consider this knowledge until an experiment was done. One has to wonder why she didn't first set up an experiment to test a duck was a duck. The study of evolution and which species of animals or plants are related to each other is founded on similarities. Mammals are mammals because of their similarities of body, brains, and behavior. A behavioral characteristic of all mammals is that they suckle their young and care for them. To do this, they have to care about things. They feel and display many similar emotions to us, and we recognize this. Being a mammal, you and I have some idea what another mammal is feeling from what he does and what the situation may be. Because, of course, we all do more or less the same sort of things when feeling that emotion. I think you probably have some vague idea of what both are feeling there. Perhaps not. Thus, because of similarities of related animals, the onus of proof must be shifted to showing that other mammals are not feeling and conscious like human mammals, unless we believe in special creation, of course. Of course, when it is convenient, we recognize our similarities and use other species, for example, to test how the brain works in a monkey because it might be useful to humans. How can that be, so, how can that be if they are so different? Surely we should do this work on humans or not do it at all. As a simple-minded ethologist and a farmer who's flirted with philosophy and professionally treats animal behavior and welfare problems and studies them for some 40 years now, both from the scientific point of view, but also taught, worked, and lived with them, I find this irrational stance peculiar. But maybe somewhere I'm missing something. If so, you better let me know. The importance of single examples. It's not always recognized by those collecting personal information that when dealing with mental attributes, 
Negative results tell us little, but even one positive example, provided it has been properly executed, will tell us something about mental events. This does not just apply to infrequent or perhaps somewhat extraordinary events. It applies generally in what is often taken for granted. For example, how, when, and where a newborn foal learns to get up, to stand, to find the teeth, to suckle, to perform the various gates. Such information tells us something about the species and the individual. We learn that this little foal had to acquire both that, to get up, declarative knowledge, and how, how to use the correct muscles and, and movements to balance procedural knowledge. In the first three hours postpartum, she tried frequently to get up, but did not often manage it. By now, nine hours postpartum, she'd learned to stand up, but not to balance. After 12 hours, she'd also learned to stand up without falling. Whether this is an atypical example is not important. What we can learn from it, that if one young equine had to learn to do these things, then such things are learned. The behavior was voluntary, and there was some mental work of some kind. Single examples which are carefully recorded and have no other simpler explanation must not be ignored when investigating mental attributes. The third point is critically assessing anecdotes and, difference, and the difference between folk knowledge and folk belief. Because of folk belief and preconceptions, anecdotes must be very critically assessed. But then they can be useful. Behaviors illustrating certain mental attributes from those who know the animals, but may not have written peer-reviewed papers, do not qualify them to be ignored. Bear in mind that the simplest ex explanation may be that the animal has the mental attributes that, is, that are attributed. Folk belief and folk knowledge are confused, and everyone, scientists or no, has preconceptions the result of their individual or cultural backgrounds. Folk belief, I'm using here, is an untested preconception. Folk knowledge is well-tested knowledge that works when applied and is in line with evolution. Because good animal teachers' futures, even their lives, may depend on knowing what is folk knowledge and what is folk belief, they generally critically assess their beliefs and those of people around them about the animals they work with. By so doing, they accumulate folk knowledge, first-hand experiences of and about their animals daily. Observational experimental scientists never have that intimacy. In fact, it is disallowed. I have learned a great deal more about the mental attributes and feelings of another in the last 20 years when researching first-hand animal teaching than all the years of observational experimental work I had previously done. The role of instinct in mammalian behavior. Now, we've been through this before, but just quickly. There are genetic predispositions or tendencies for a mammal to perform particular behaviors. Different species of mammals have their own innate instinctive tendencies or predispositions to do particular things. For example, a human to walk on two legs, an elephant on four. However, when, where, how, and if these general mammalian or species-specific instinctive tendencies are performed and how they develop depends on the individual's experiences during his or her lifetime. Children raised by wolves, for example, tended not to walk on two legs. Different mammal species to live in particular environment, uh, different mammal species live in, in, in particular environments and social groups. But whether the individual does or does not, depends on his, his or her lifetime experiences. There are predispositions in all equines to perform behaviors such as getting up, standing, walking, trotting, cantering, but how, when, where, and if they are performed requires mental work of an intentional kind while they're being learnt, although thereafter they may become habits performed without direct attention. The first thing to look at in our search for a better understanding of other mammals then is similarities and differences between them. We've been through this in the conference a bit, but I just want to outline it. First, the bodies. There is similar structural skeletal structure. A humerus is a humerus, whether it comes from a meerkat, a human, or an elephant. The same with hearts, lungs, spleens, intestines, and even brains. 
There are similarities in physiology, neurophysiology, and, of course, behavior. Um, a humerus is a humerus, whether or not, uh, you know, the bodies look very different, the skeletal bodies, but actually they're all very similar structures. And what about brains? Well, the interesting thing about this slide, it slide uh, is the number of convolutions which are supposed to have something to do with uh, the general size of the cortex and whatnot in both the cow and the horse compared to man's best friend, the dog and the human. More interestingly are the superimposed species differences and how these may influence their feelings and consciousness. Size is one of the most obvious, which have a very large effect on the species worldview, which will affect their, space, their concept of space, time and speed. A mouse will have a very different world view from that of an elephant. The conception of near and far will be different for a fast-moving four-legged equine who is able to cover a distance of 160 kilometers in 24 hours and can sprint at 40 kilometers an hour from a human who can travel only about 80 kilometers in 24 hours and with a maximum sprint speed of around about 20 kilometers per hour. An ele elephant's top speed is around the same but she can only keep it up for a few minutes. What an individual, whether an individual flies, dives, runs, climbs, jumps, will clearly also affect his worldview, what is important and possible for him. How he senses the world, whether blind, deaf, dumb, able to hear infrared or infra or ultrasound, able to pick up very slight visual cues or smell or taste slight changes, will affect his worldview but it need not cause us to throw up our hands and consider it impossible to know how another mammal feels or is aware of the world. We can still recognize our similarities and have some idea what another is feeling in a lot of situations, although they were, we may make mistakes and we certainly need to do some homework. For example, the elephant's trunk is sensitive to touch and smell and is used to manipulate the world. They use their trunk a great deal when communicating, 39% of the 84 behaviors and over 2,500 interactions that we have measured were involved the trunk. We can get a little closer to what it might be like to have a trunk if we imagine having hands that could smell as, do, as well as do everything else they do. By contrast, equines use smell for only 5.8% of their interactions and touch and taste another 5%. But they use sight for 82% of the 6,720 interactions that we've scored. Smell then is likely to be very important for elephants, less so for equines who primarily use vision and not very important at all for humans who have a relatively vestigial olfactory sensitivity. Although we can all probably develop our sensitivities somewhat more. If the mammal has functional eyes, then they function in the same way in all mammals with a retina, iris and cornea although their acuity, use, size, color, discriminations, places in the body and other aspects vary. Consequently, if not blind, all mammals can see shapes, movements, and some shade discriminations, although some may be more or less sensitive to these and other characteristics. Equines have a very acute visual sensitivity to movement, hence the clever Hans effect. Horses and, elephant, and e elephants' eyes are at the side of their heads, Consequently, they have two large monocular visual fields compared to the smaller binocular visual field of humans. Consider for a moment, not the usual story of the restricted binocular visual field of these animals, but rather their enormous monocular visual fields and consequently the amount of different information from each eye that is fed into the brain simultaneously and with two foveas. How is all this sorted, acted on, or at least taken into account? Color vision is now believed to be widespread in mammals, including horses, and we've done some tests here. But the range of colors and the ability to pick up single, slightly varying shades varies between species. An individual's experiences are the results of a mixing and matching of sensory information with other mental events, attention, present context, feelings, memories, and so forth. 
We can therefore suggest that horses who are very sensitive to visual signals are likely to have mental attributes and memories based on a visual public language, although other senses, such as touch and smell, also play an important role. By contrast, in an elephant, it may be that thought, that is, mental events, are usually the result of combining tactile, auditory, infrasound, and smelling cues with vision where appropriate. Humans' thoughts are predominantly verbal and visual. We can learn to cue into others' awareness better, though. For example, we can become much more attuned to smells and other mammals to listen to human language and learn the meaning of words. As Nagel pointed out when considering bats, being able to fly and navigate by ultrasound requires particular sense receptors and the brain to go with them and will have a large effect on the species' point of view. But Nagel admitted to point out that since bats are also mammals, even though their world is different, mammalian commonalities allow us to begin to understand what it might be like to be a bat. They feel hungry, tired, energetic, frightened, panicked, confused until it is proved otherwise. We may never know exactly what it might be like to be a bat any more than I will know exactly what it is to be you. But a less pessimistic view of other mammals is the result of our mutual ability to understand the experiences and feelings of another, of a related species. And it's generally reasonably successful in predicting outcomes, both for the non-human mammal and the human. We tend to forget that the dogmatic belief in human superior mental abilities, that the mammals we are living with have to learn about us, whether or not we learn from and about them. By combining the characteristics of the species' body and lifestyle with other characteristics, we can begin to understand their consciousness. Feelings, together with other mental attitudes, make up experiences. What feelings are felt come from immediate sensations and emotions with feedback loops to knowing, remembering, imagining, working out, thinking. That is a whole lot of mental events. With feelings, mammals can acquire knowledge, make choices and decisions, integrate and sort a raft of other mental attributes to allow adaptation to the changing and somewhat chaotic world. They can make mistakes, get things right, behave rationally and irrationally. Thus, emotions and feelings are the underlying groundwork of mammalian behavior, welfare, and consciousness. But feelings don't come from nowhere. Other mental events are in the mix. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about a theory of mind. It is fashionable to argue that only humans have an awareness that others have minds, consequently desires and needs. But consider this. Without having some idea of what others are doing and feeling, the individual will be unable to live in an organized social group. Normal humans, equines, and elephants live in organized, complex societies. Equines and elephants are sentient and care about things and others within their group. They recognize other individuals and they recognize their roles. They have likes and dislikes and make allowances for some, for the young, for example. And if they do not have any experience of learning the social rules and are unaware of what another feels, they behave abnormally. For example, humans, equines, and elephants who've been isolated when young from their own and other species have similar social difficulties. They frequently find it difficult to read others' moods and therefore to predict their behavior. Stallions, to be used for breeding, are often isolated when weaned and kept alone. They consequently do not learn when and how to approach mares, to court and to have mutually accepted sex. As a result, the mares have to be twitched, that is a a rope twisted around their nose very tight, and trussed up with ropes to allow them to be raped without injuring the stallion. This, I may say, is current breeding practice in any pedigree horse. By contrast, if allowed to learn the social graces and how to approach and court mares, stallions of the same breeds can become well-accepted lovers, and mares may have sex with them even when they're pregnant or not in estrus, just like humans. Shared emotions were first pointed out by Merleau-Ponty. Every day we use them to predict the behavior of other humans and other mammals if we have to do with them. Our understanding of other mammals' feelings and experiences are based on knowing that they will be something like our own. If other humans have feelings, then other mammals have feelings too. 
Humans learn something about how other mammals are feeling by recognizing common behaviors. For example, even if you've never seen an elephant, you have an idea of when he's relaxed or when he's aggressive or frightened, even though he looks very different from you. Emotions are autobiographically compared. I think you probably all may have an idea of what that filly is feeling, maybe, if you know anything at all about other mammals, maybe not. Try this one. Here we have a little uh, two-year-old elephant who was orphaned and nursed back to life by the woman in the truck. Here is this little toddler trying terribly hard to get into the truck with her short little legs. Perhaps you have some idea what she might be feeling. Maybe you don't know how your toddler's feeling either. If an individual does not experience them, um, then he may be able to learn certain stimuli result in certain responses, but he will have no idea of the actual experiences nor will he be able to predict behavior or react flexibly. One illustration of the necessary existence of a theory of mind in mammals is their ability to form and maintain strong mutually desired emotional bonds, not only within their own species, but between species, between humans and non-humans, for example. And we, do, we have a different relationship with them, usually, than we do with our cooker or our motor car. Most people do, anyway. This is mutual. Non-human mammals who have experience of people can become very skilled at having some idea of what a human is feeling, and even why, occasionally. That mammals are able to understand general emotional states of humans has been well known through centuries and used to build into animal practices, for example, hunting or training elephants, training horses, or the rediscovery by the natural horsemen of today. If well done, teaching can be developed into a mutual desire to work together, that is, collective intentionality. I'm just going to talk about this because it's something that interests me. Collective intentionality is not social facilitation, doing the same thing as others, or as a habit because of common physiological needs. Rather, it is defined as having an awareness of what others are doing and combining this with a desire to contribute to the doing of it, that is, a we attitude to performing something. To distinguish it from social facilitation, the examples must show each individual doing something different to achieve the common goal. Searle's, cl Searle's classical example is instrumentalists playing in an orchestra. The most common example in non-primate mammals is lionesses, not lions, by the way, as we thought uh, during this thing, hunting. Here, each lioness has different work to do, but all are contributing to catching the prey. During hunting, they have to know and predict what the others are doing and decide when and how to do their part. Since all the behaviors are voluntary, the individuals must be in some sense aware of their role in what they're doing and have to make judgments when and how to perform in conjunction with the others. Thus, collective intentionality requires more than just a want or desire. It involves putting together self-related mental attributes and acting on them, more than just having consciousness of being in the world. There are examples from everyday life of equines and elephants, for example. For example, equines who have learned to open the stable door of others to gallop off into the field together, or elephants who have learned to push one of their kind into a fence to smash it down so they can all cross. More common examples, again, come from when they're working with humans to achieve a common goal. Horses pulling together to move a log, a stuck vehicle, or a plough when asked. Elephants stacking logs, one holding the log while the other pushes it into place where it will be balanced. A ridden horse making every effort to win a race when asked by his rider, although some are much more competitive and try harder than others. There's an example of what I would call collective intentionality. These elephants uh, are not controlled in any way. They are wandering around in a 100 hectare un, un, uh, without any constraints, but they are keeping them, they, they are going, we are going 
going the way we both want to go, both the humans and the elephants. Sometimes the mammal disobeys or disregards inappropriate human cues. The most obvious example there are sheepdogs and riding school horses. Sometimes they perform innovative actions to achieve a desired goal. An elephant who places his tusks under a log and uses his trunk to balance it, or a ridden horse that takes a new, difficult route to meet others rather than following the path. This readiness to engage in working jointly towards goals set by humans is characteristic of many mammals, both traditionally wild and domestic. And the more one works with other mammals and teaches them, the more this becomes evident. Now, there are two other important points about emotions. First of all, there's a common cultural belief that animals never lie. Neither humans nor other mammals always display what they're apparently feeling, either verbally for humans or behaviorally. For example, Crystal, a purebred Arab mare, always behaved quietly while others were leaping around excitedly at competitions. When her heart and respiration rate were taken, it was found that her physiological responses were the same as the others, but she was not displaying her feelings behaviorally as the others were. There are also some emotions that one species may not display or feel, which another does. The stallion snake face. This is performed to try and keep the mares he lives with away from other males. The mares are on the left-hand side. Although humans do not display, because you know the con- once you know the context, you can actually have a fair old guess, something like what that horse is feeling. And although they don't, we don't display these same sort of uh, emotions. So then there's the problem of learning. Human and non-human mammals learn by using all types of learning, but the majority of time, When they're learning about the world or when being taught, they learn by instrumental conditioning. That is learning to perform voluntary actions. Here, the individual makes a choice to do it or not, and what to do. He has a desire, a want, a feeling, called motivation, to achieve a goal. This desire, motivation, is driven by obtaining some reward or avoiding some bad experience. Mammals also learn by associating one stimulus with another into what have become symbolic chains, otherwise called associative learning. Trial and error, observational or social learning are other types of instrumental conditioning that are widely used, all involving voluntary actions and feelings. One thing we have found is that equines and elephants, among other species, can learn by imitating the action of another, even of another species. The human teacher in this case Imitating new acts indicates the awareness of another and their ability to make an analogy of one part of themselves to that of the other. For example, when teaching the subject to take his head or lift a leg, they all perform quicker if the teacher did the action, and this is published material that we've done. Thus, they must have an analogy between the head or leg movement of the teacher and their own. Imitation involves not only a consciousness of the world around, but also an awareness of another's and one's own body, and perhaps mirror neurons, who knows. In order to acquire the necessary knowledge to live the lives we know, these animals live, they also acquire information by silent or cognitive learning. Elephants and equines know where they are when they're in their home area. They will also find their way home from long distances. Nobody quite knows how far. Their awareness of slight environmental changes is also well known by trainers. Shindi, an eight-year-old mare, shied and stopped with ears pricked where the end of a log lying half concealed beside the road had been moved by 20 degrees. She had not had any instrumental learning experience with the log previously, although she had passed it frequently. We gave the same test to resident humans who frequently walked past the log. They didn't notice it had changed. And, que- and when questioned, they had no feelings. Habits and habits of mind. After learning to perform various acts voluntarily, humans, elephants, and equines can perform complex behavioral sequences without attention and apparent conscious awareness, driving motor cars, elephants stacking logs, horses jumping, and so on. The be- behavior has become a habit. These skills were initially learned by performing voluntary actions 
which involves paying attention, being aware, conscious of what they were doing, making decisions and choices, and learning that and how, declarative and procedural knowledge. There are also habits of mind. There are certain ways of thinking that we establish and then continue to think in that way. And I think there is a bit of confusion here about habits. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally clear, but I'm not sure anyone is. Unlike some sub conscious or unconscious actions, habitual actions can be brought back to conscious awareness, voluntary decision-making and attention when necessary. And the evolution and advantages of the establishments of habits is fairly clear. It allows the attention, awareness, consciousness, whatever you will, to be directed elsewhere when all goes normally. Elephants and equines and humans form habits very fast. Okay, I'm not anywhere near the end. Ecological knowledge, becoming a good natural ecologist. All aspects of a species' ecology will affect its world view. Consider the difference in the ec ecological knowledge between an equine, an elephant, or a human who's been born and raised in a captive urban environment will have compared to that of his conspecific raised in a wild or rural environment. Equines, elephants, aborigines, or bushmen have to become natural botanists, natural geographers, natural zoologists, natural ethologists, good natural ecologists, if they're going to survive and reproduce. Social knowledge, becoming a natural sociologist and having a theory of mind. Oh. Uh, to be accepted to live in any organized society requires each individual to have an individual personality and a role in the society. Some are more social than others, some more aggressive, affiliative, some extroverts, some introverts. And those are the things that I have uh, measured in a group of elephants. And there are six elephants there, which just shows the difference, certain differences. You, you won't be able to see the details of it, really. They have to know the social... They have to learn to recognize and predict the behavior of others, form friendships and dislikes. They know the social rules, the social contract... If an individual doesn't learn these, he will be accepted as not to be accepted as part of the society and be able to live with them. For example, if he is very aggressive and attacks the young, he will be avoided and finally chased out to the periphery of the group. Individuals have varied social desires, moods and feelings, and beliefs, expectations as a result of past experiences. Everyday elephants and equines are not autistic. They live, love, work, play, bore, are born and die in complex organized societies, sometimes including several species of mammals. And to do this, they must know the rules, be aware of others have minds and feelings, and be able to communicate with each other. And if this isn't the case, it needs to be proved. Memory. If the individual can learn to perform voluntary acts and acquire knowledge, there are a prerequisite to have a memory, Memory comes in various forms, long and short term, and uh, despite our belief that uh, elephants have particularly long memory, there is no particular evidence for this. Horses have just the same sort of length of memory as far as we can tell. Episodic memory displays an awareness of what happened. Well-established folk knowledge indicates that equines and elephants do have at least something like episodic memory. Anyone has experience with mammals knows, often to their cost, that they have no trouble remembering past, particularly incidences or episodes, and relating them to the present. The accepted facts are, then, that non-human mammals have a memory, that they remember particular things, situations, and occurrences, and they distinguish the present from the memories of the past. Since equines and elephants don't speak in human tongues, their memories are not verbal. Rather, they are visual, auditory, olfactory, gestatory, tactile, emotional, or a mixture of these. They must know what the real experiences of the present are and know that they are present ones in order for them to decide how to behave at that moment. Rationality, dreaming, and imagination. Implicit and volley instrumental learning, at least in teaching these animals, is a belief. This will follow that, and some cause and effect thinking. If this, then that. Simple rational reasoning. Memories of the same event stored by different individuals are not identical, and they can also be changed on recall. Indeed, after several replays, they may hardly resemble the incident that occurred in the first case, yet they can still determine future behavior. 
This unreliability of memory and the implied creative or inventiveness is the basis of imagination, defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as a mental faculty forming images of external objects not present to the senses. Attention. It is clear that these species, as well as humans, do not always select what they pay attention to, but they can be selective, and in this sense, conscious of what they're paying attention to. Now, I'll just talk about human language, consciousness, and so on. A frequently used argument for uniqueness of humans' language is to link it to human language. But the no language, no consciousness is a soft and unhelpful option. There are two important differences, however, between human language and equine and elephant communication. And our group has measured the performance and recipient responses over 100 behaviors in cattle, equines, rhino, and elephants. The, first of all, the meaning of words and phrases in human language is of its nature context independent. The same word means the same thing in different situations. By contrast, the meaning of a message in equine and elephant communication is context dependent. The same thing is used in different situations. So it's an analog system to indicate the general state of excitement of the animal rather than a specific message. The specific message is interpreted by assessing the context. And secondly, different behaviors convey a message that may be, may be given simultaneously in elephants and equines. We've recorded up to five different behaviors performed at once. The meaning of the message is immediate. By contrast, human language is linear. The meaning of the message is not explicit until its end. These differences in communication between species implies that to correctly understand a message, equines and elephants must be more aware of their surroundings. They must have a well-developed awareness of others, what others are doing, feeling, and desiring perhaps more than is necessary for the context-independent language user. Individuals do make mistakes, just like humans. Then we can talk about subconscious and unconscious behavior, but I'm going to skip it, and body self-awareness and reflex consciousness. And the only thing I would say here is, are they aware of their own mind or feelings? One clue comes here from teaching these animals and instilling or destroying their confidence that they can do what is asked. And this is a really very important thing when you're teaching animals. Are they confident in doing that or not? And how can you reinstate confidence? Conclusions. The attention of consciousness, the attribution of consciousness to non-human mammals appears to reflect the cultural background from which the author comes, his or her general interests and beliefs, rather than a particular trait. And I have an enormous table here which shows a summary of the different subjective mental abilities, but I, you'll be pleased to hear you're not going to see it. This, I think, is the first step in assessing subjectivity. The next is the individual equine and elephant subjectivity and how this is molded by the lifetime experiences. Assembling knowledge from all the various disciplines avoids the common pursuit of ignorance, cultural domination, and folk belief we can begin to understand our own and other species consciousness by using this conditional anthropomorphic approach. Although perhaps we will never know exactly what another is feeling and his experiences, we can make a rough guess. Non-humans do not use human language, but this has done little to change what we feel, if we feel at all. Human language and its concomitant mentality can be a cognitive handicap, preventing us from appreciating and learning from other world views. The conclusion is that far from having inferior types of consciousness, we must begin to understand and appreciate other mammals, different types of consciousness, which can, in, which can enrich our own world. Such diverse in, in, in interpretations might help us to provide different ideas of how to live in the world and confront the ever-increasing environmental problems. Now, I do have a little, uh, a little bit of... Um, video just for amusement's sake. This is um, cooperative teaching, which is what uh, I teach humans to do to teach animals. This is a free 25-year-old uh, male elephant who has 100 hectares to wander about in and has a whole bunch of other friends to do this with. He has, however, decided to take part in our class. 
I'm afraid it's only a research film. It hasn't been done to show people, so it's a bit funny. And there is the class going on. And he is uh, rather interrupting it with his... Uh, And these are rhino, unfortunately, these are black rhino. There are now probably less than 3,000 alive. These were animals that had to be kept inside at night. And during the day, they were out and about doing what they wanted. But during the night, they had to be kept in guarded enclosures. I may tell you that they've all been killed now. This is in Zimbabwe. However, before they were killed, we did manage to breed 13 to be reintroduced to the wild. Um, and this is just a little bit of handling of rhino to show that they too can quite enjoy what you do to them. <laughs> that, she, she voluntarily lay down to be scratched. Okay, end of story. Thank you. Well, uh, 